Yarostan's Sixth Letter Dear Sophia, Your honest and moving letter embarrasses and shames me. I'm ashamed because I haven't been as open in my letters to you. I'm embarrassed by your declarations of your love for me. I can't honestly tell you that I feel or ever felt a similar emotion towards you. I failed to make this clear to you at the very beginning of our correspondence, at a time when I was nothing more to you than a one-time friend you hadn't seen in twenty years, a stranger to whom you hadn't yet bared the secrets of your life. My only excuse is that I'm not in the habit of expressing my emotions with words. My life's experiences haven't been fertile ground for the development of such an ability. I realize that by trying to be honest and complete at such a late hour, I'll be inflicting pain which I could have spared you if I had made the attempt sooner but I'm afraid that if I remain silent, I would ultimately inflict far greater pain. By vomiting up the repressed experiences of your life, as you so vividly put it, you set off a similar process in me, in Jasna and in Myrna, not only by your example, but even more by what you brought up. We didn't respond to your letter with our minds, but with our stomachs, with everything that's inside us. After reading your previous letter, Myrna had expressed admiration for you, comparing your rebelliousness and courage to her brother's. Her attitude toward you has changed drastically since I last wrote you, not so much because of what you've written as because of what we've undergone during the past two weeks. After I last wrote you, we experienced one of the happiest moments of our lives, at least one of the happiest in my memory. That happy moment came to an abrupt end three days ago. Your letter arrived the day before yesterday. If it had come two days sooner, we would have responded to it very differently. For the past three days, I have been moving in an atmosphere of hostility and fear, the like of which I haven't experienced since the days immediately after my release from prison three years ago. The arrival of your letter didn't create that atmosphere, but simply coincided with it. I can't account for this fear and hostility in terms of a single event. An event did take place. We heard it announced over the radio. But this event isn't new. It's one of the constants of the world we live in. It's common knowledge. The radio reminded us that now that we're no longer watched by the national police, we're still being watched by the international police. No one had doubted this. Such a reminder could immobilize us only because immobility is already engraved in our being, only because our interminable and continuing past taught us to immobilize ourselves. I don't fully understand what happened to us three days ago, but I'm convinced it had less to do with the radio announcement than with what we've become during the past 20 years. Three weeks ago, a few days after Jasna and I attended the lecture given by your and our former comrades, Yasna came to our house again. Yara invited her, ostensibly to read the letter in which you described your dismissal from school, your eviction from the dormitory, and your arrival at Sabina's garage. But actually, so as to pursue her speculations about the love affairs of Minister Vera and Commissioner Adrian. Yasna read your letter. Before she finished it, she started crying. Don't you think she's wonderful? she asked. Think of being beaten down so often and so hard and still having the nerve to reach for more. When she finished reading your letter, she said, It must take a lot of nerve to be a prostitute. Please do let me know when you hear from her again. She left our house with tears in her eyes. When Yasna was gone, Myrna whispered, You're certainly no Sabina, teacher. A lot of nerve to be a prostitute. It takes doing, not just reading about it. Yara ran to Mira's lap, shouting, She's not altogether like that, Mommy. I used to think that, she was until the last day of school. Remember I told you we danced in the yard? One of the teachers played an accordion. Yasna just sat by herself and watched the kids dance. I could tell by the way her eyes and her whole body moved that she was dying to dance, so I begged Slobodan to ask her. You should have seen her. She was wilder than anyone else in the yard. Slobodan wanted her all to himself, but I cut in, and even the principal danced with her. The principal wore out after two rounds, but Yasna just went on dancing. Mommy, let's give a dancing party for Yasna. Don't be silly, Yara, Myrna said crossly. But you just said it takes doing. Dancing is doing. Poor Yasna is always so sad, and she was so happy when she danced. No one would dance with Yasna here. I'll bring Slobodan. He'll dance with her, Yara insisted. I'll bring you Julia's phonograph and records, and Julia and I will both dance with Yasna. Besides, she can bring her own friends. Does Yasna have any friends? Are you thinking of Commissioner Pavershan, Myrna asked sarcastically. Yara turned to me. You'll dance with her, won't you, father? I've never danced in my whole life, I told her, although her idea appealed to me. Yara stomped her foot on the floor in front of Myrna and said angrily, But you told me he danced. Myrna smiled absently. I then thought mischievously. Yara saw the smile, reached for Myrna's hand, and shouted excitedly, You remember? 
You said he'd take both my hands in his, pick me up in his arms, and spin me round and round this room. While Yara talked, Myrna picked her up, and both of them spun together like a top. Faster and faster, Yara continued, until we fall from dizziness. When Myrna and Yara reached the ground, I laughed and shouted, I'd love to dance with you, Yara, but I swear to you I never dance with your mother or with anyone else. They didn't hear me. Myrna and Yara were completely absorbed by their performance. And then we roll on the ground, still spinning, dizzy, laughing and happy. Father kisses me. Before the performance ended, I noticed that Myrna carried out every one of Yara's instructions mechanically, as if in a trance. When Myrna raised herself up after the kiss, her smile was gone. Her face was covered with tears, and it had the same absent look. What happened then, Yara? Yara's joy ended abruptly, with an expression of terror on her face, tears running down her cheeks. She turned to the door and wailed, Vesna, she saw us. And then, Yara, Myrna asked with the same expressionless tone. Yara started bawling, but she suddenly sapped out of it. She got up and ran toward the door, shouting, Don't, Mommy. I can't think of Vesna every day for the rest of my life. I can't and I won't. It wasn't our fault. She died because of what they did to her, and you know it. Yara ran to her room, sobbing. Myrna became aware that I was staring at her. She wiped her face hurriedly, still kneeling on the spot where she'd kissed Yara. Why do you have a strange look on your face? She asked matter-of-factly, as if nothing had been strange except the look on my face. Myrna, I don't understand. What don't you understand, Yarastan, about the dance? My father danced with me when I was Yara's age. Myrna got up and went to her bedroom, leaving me alone in the living room, bewildered. It was very late. I wanted to ask her a lot of questions, but the only one I was able to formulate was why she had been so hostile to Yara's idea of having a party. Yara doesn't want very much, and I've never before known Myrna to refuse anything Yara wanted. I didn't have a chance to ask Myrna the following evening either, that was Thursday, because we had unexpected company, and by Friday Myrna herself had become the main advocate for a dancing party. The unexpected guest was Zednik Tabarkin. He dropped by just before we sat down to eat to tell us his plant had gone on strike that morning. He was full of life. You didn't think it could happen, did you, Cassandra? He asked me, laughing vigorously. A full-fledged strike. Ousted all managers, supervisors, and functionaries. Elected workers are to fill the necessary offices, and their mandates are revocable. And all the rest of it carried out in general assembly of the workers themselves, without politicians or any repressive apparatus. Then it's the first time in history, I said. At least in our history, he corrected. Myrna invited him to join us at dinner. I was hoping you'd ask me, Zednik exclaimed. It's not a night to return to my room alone, and the bar depresses me. Besides, I wanted to hear about the coming strike in your plant. Mine? Myrna asked. There isn't even talk of a strike, only a few whispers. It's now or never, Zednik said, taunting him. Then it's never, Myrna snapped. There was talk of a strike once, twelve years ago, and everyone who talked was fired. Most of the... Most of the fired women never got jobs again. Two of them disappeared, like Jan. They never returned. Myrna was referring to the agitation at the time of the Magarna uprising. She had been very excited when Jan, Titus, and I had discussed the uprising at our house a few days before Jan and I were arrested. But apparently she hadn't done any agitating at her plant, since she wasn't fired. None of the people working there now can forget that, she continued. And then, looking at Yara, she added, We're going to think of that every day for the rest of our lives. Times change, Myrna, Zednik said, and even if they don't, even if Cassandra is always right, you can't lock yourself up today because someone else is going to lock you up tomorrow. Can't I? Myrna asked defiantly. Yara and I sat at the table, and the four of us started eating. All right, you're doing it, Zednik said. I know you can do it. It's what we've all been doing. We've repressed ourselves to avoid being repressed. What sense is there in that? Shrewd, peasant sense, Myrna answered, winking at me obviously referring to my characterizations of Myrna and her father in my letters to you. In a few years, there'll be no peasants left, so what good did it do them? Zednik asked. Those who stayed out of trouble lived longer, Myrna answered. You mean they didn't live at all? Zednik shouted angrily. Yara added, There are some kids who stayed out of the demonstrations in my school. No one talked to them after that, and they weren't even invited to the next week's outing, so what good did it do them to stay out of trouble? Exactly, Zednik shouted although it seemed to me that Yara's example did not exactly support Zednik's argument, since nowadays, at least at Yara's school, it takes more nerve to stay out of demonstrations than to conform by taking part in them. What's life to you, Zednik? Strikes and demonstrations? Myrna asked, shifting the context of the argument. Then I never lived. A few times in my life I had the nerve to abandon myself to my desires. I felt intensely alive and paid dearly, with the lives of those I loved. But that doesn't count in your philosophy. You're wrong, Myrna, Zednik pleaded, seeming hurt by her comment. That's all that counts in my philosophy. The strikes are only the first step. 
If they don't lead to what you're describing, they're nothing. In a strike, we only announce that we've had enough of this repression of life, this non-life. We express our refusal to continue being chained to machines and cowed by police. But it's obviously not enough to announce that we're coming to life. We have to do what we've announced. We have to find the nerve to live, to dance on the tomb of the repressive apparatus. We danced on the last day of school, Yara exclaimed. Zednik and I burst out laughing. Yara smiled, but pretending to be angry, she planted herself next to Zednik and asked him, Why are you laughing, silly? Wasn't that what you meant? Zednik picked her up, placed her on his lap, still laughing, and told her, Because you can say what I mean much better than I can, you little devil. Are you going to dance on the last day of your factory? Yara asked. Zednik roared, I dream of nothing else. I haven't danced for over twenty years, and I am bursting with desire to dance. Yara twisted Zednik's mustache and said coyly, I like you, Mr. Tabarkin, but I don't like your name. Can I call you something else? How about just calling me Zednik? I can't call you that. You're too old. Myrna grinned, leaped out of her chair, blushing, swept Yara off Zednik's lap, carried her to the kitchen, and asking in a whisker, whisper, Too old for what, you little goose? The following evening, Myrna came home from work an hour later than usual. Throwing her arms around me and spinning me around the room, she shouted, We spent the whole day talking about our strike. At your plant, I asked. And we're going to talk about it all next week before voting, she continued excitedly. We'll talk and talk until every single one of us is convinced. Is the vote going to have to be unanimous, I asked with dismay. It's the only way we can avoid what happened 12 years ago, but it'll be possible. Today, the talk spread like a disease. In the morning, there were only a few whispers. By the end of the day, we were embracing in the aisles, throwing spools across the room. Those women went crazy. That's not the disease, but the beginning of the cure. It's a disease, you oaf. We're sick. We've gone crazy, she shouted, tripping me so that we both fell to the floor. It's exactly what happened 12 years ago. Disease, disease. Where's that bewitched daughter of yours? Yara. Yara came running out of the kitchen. As soon as she reached us, Myrna pur pulled her down to the floor between us. Her arms wound around both of us. Myrna whispered to Yara, No one is too old, Yara, ever, for anything. Yara, with tears in her eyes, threw her arms around Myrna's neck and whispered, I love you when you're like this, Mommy. You devil, you're going to win, Myrna whispered. When are we going to have that dancing party? Yara covered Myrna's face with, face with kisses. How about Sunday? No, Julia can't come then. A week from tonight. Your father and I will set the stage. You bring the characters. Fair? You're fair, Mommy. You're always fair. You won't change your mind? And if I do? We'll have the party anyway. For a whole week, Myrna was a person I had never known. She's always been energetic, but on that Friday, two weeks ago, Myrna seemed to acquire the energy of a girl Yara's age. She reminded me very much of a girl I knew briefly 20 years ago, your energetic 12-year-old sister. Myrna seemed to shed 20 years of her life to become a girl who hadn't lived through her husband's imprisonment, her brother's murder, her father's death, her mother's insanity, her firstborn daughter's death. Setting the stage meant transforming our living room into a ballroom. On Saturday, Myrna ran all over the city looking for appropriate decorations. We spent all Sunday as well as Monday and Tuesday evenings removing all the furniture as well as the rug, and then scrubbing and finishing a floor that hadn't been cleaned since Myrna bought the house 13 years ago. Wednesday night we decorated our ballroom, and Thursday we installed Julia's record player. Myrna insisted that Yara bring only records with real, namely traditional peasant, dance music, and not those noisy things. Meanwhile, Yara spent the week collecting the cast. Two days before the big event, I asked her whom she'd invited. Yara enumerated, First of all, there's me, because I'm giving the party. Then there's you and Mommy, because you did all the work. Then there's Julia, because the music is hers, and Slobodan, because he's our boyfriend. Finally, there's Mr. Javarkin, because he wants to dance, and Yasna, because she's so sad. I wanted four couples, but Yasna wanted me to invite Mr. Zebron. So I told Yasna I had my reasons for wanting exactly three and a half couples. And I do. I'd rather have three and a half couples than someone who might spoil everything. But I told Yasna not to worry. I said, you couldn't wait to dance with her. Devil, please don't call me that, father, she shouted, running off to her room. The dancing party took place a week ago. If our neighbor, Mr. Nanovo, had been home, he might have thought the revolution had broken out in our house. Music blared out all our doors and windows, which we kept open because it was a warm spring night with a perfectly clear sky and a full moon. Someone kept running in and out all around the house. Mr. Nanovo would have been subjected to the experience of seeing and hearing happy human beings. Of course, we wouldn't have been as happy if Mr. Nanovo had been homed. His mere presence would have depressed us and muffled our joy. But Mr. Nanovo wasn't home. He hasn't been home for months. Maybe he died. Myrna completed her stage-setting tasks by placing a record on Julia's player. I saw Yara pinch Slobodan's behind, and the two girls' boyfriend dutifully walked up to Yasna and asked her to dance. Yasna graciously accepted her pupil's invitation, and the moment she placed her left hand on her hip, snapped the fingers of her right hand, and jumped, 
all of us were magically transported to another planet. Meek, skinny Yasna, who in real life is well over 40 and probably close to 50, was transformed on the dance floor into a stunningly beautiful child. She outdid her partner in grace, agility, and, sp and speed. She was unmistakably the younger of the pair. Her usually sad and troubled face was an expression of pure joy covered only by her long hair, which she periodically swept back like a fan swinging her head in rhythm to the music. I could have spent the rest of the night leaning on the wall watching Yasna dance. But it was Yara's party, and Yara wasn't about to let me do as I wished. She must have pinched Julia's behind, because as soon as the first record ended, Julia was standing in front of me with both hands stretched out, asking me to dance. I'm very flattered, I told Julia, but I'll have to take some lessons first. You don't need Mr. Lessons, Mr. Vocek, Julia shouted. Yara showed me how you danced. It's such fun that we both taught Slobodan to dance the way you do. Oh, she did, did she? I asked, annoyed by this information. Looking angrily at Myrna, I shouted, Well, I'll have you know I was under a magician's spell when I showed Yara that dance. Myrna laughed, threw me a kiss, and looked for another record. I felt Yara at my side, pulling at my arm. When I bent down, she bit my ear and whispered, Come on, father, don't be such a coward. The music started playing. All right, Cinderella, I said firmly, bracing myself against the wall. So you'd like to do the dance I showed my daughter? Very well. I stuck out my arms, and Julia pulled me away from the wall. We were in the middle of the dance floor. Everyone's eyes were on us. Julia jumped up and down. Suddenly, I got into the spirit of the thing. I actually danced for the first time in my life. I bent down, picked up Julia, and started turning around with her. She hollered. The record Myrna had picked out was very fast, so I spun faster and faster. Unfortunately, I got dizzy much faster than Myrna had on the day she first showed me my dance. I hit my head against the wall and dropped Julia to the floor. In dismay, I rushed away from the wall thinking Julia might be hurt, but I couldn't see her, or rather, I saw any number of Julia spinning all over the floor. One of them found my hand, pulled it to her lips, and shouted, Hey, Mr. Vocek, don't forget the end of the dance. I had, in fact, forgotten. As I bent down, I fell right on top of what must have been the one real Julia, kissed her ten-and-a-half-year-old lips, raised myself up proudly, and staggered to a corner of the room. From my corner, I heard my appreciative audience fill the room with laughter. As soon as my performance ended, Julia and Slobodan walked out of the house hand in hand, undoubtedly in order to determine whether she or I had won the bout. Myrna busily hunted for another record, while Yara planted herself in front of Zednik. Oh, I can't dance the way your father can, Zednik said shyly. I shouted, Come on, Zednik, don't be such a coward! Yara pulled him to the center of the dance floor, saying, I don't want everyone to dance the same way. Zednik and Yara danced, or rather, Yara danced around Zednik, who did not become transformed into a boy on the dance floor. He retained his nearly 60 years. Suddenly, Myrna started chuckling. Hey, Zednik, you're wonderful, she shouted with glee. You dance just like a peasant I loved once. You even look like him. I wasn't as impressed as Myrna. Zednik looked like he was dancing only so long as I kept my eyes above his waist. As soon as I looked at his feet, I noticed they barely budged. One of his knees bent occasionally. As soon as Yasna bur burst out laughing, I realized Myrna's compliment was a joke. Even so, Zednik turned to Myrna and bowed majestically. Thank you. I'm very flattered. Don't be, I said. She means her father. As soon as I said that, Yara stopped dancing, looked up at Zednik's face, and shouted, You do look just like him. Stay right there. Don't move. Yara ran out of the room and returned with a photograph of Myrna's father. Look, she shouted to Zednik. You look just like him. Zednik seemed unconvinced. Well, he said, he does have a mustache. Yasna and I laughed. Myrna blushed. That's what I can call you, Yara announced victoriously. Mustache? Zednik asked. No, silly. Grandfather. Won't your real grandfather be jealous? He died when I was a year old. All were silent while the record completed its melody. Yara left the room with the photograph of her grandfather. Julie and Slobodan returned. Myrna started a new record, walked towards Zednik, and asked coyly, Would you dance with me, grandfather? Do I look like your grandfather, too? Zednik asked with dismay. That's no longer so flattering. My father, then. Yara's grandfather. My father. And the peasant you loved once? He asked. Myrna blushed, then bowed as majestically to Zednik as he had to her, and started to dance around him. I was again transported out of this world. The woman on the dance floor was the peasant girl I had fallen in love with fourteen years ago. But she was more, infinitely more. I loved Myrna for fourteen years, only six of which I've spent with her. But the woman dancing with Zednik was someone I had never known someone whose existence had never been possible, someone who burst into life fully grown after more than two decades of repressed growth. Her motions weren't agile or light like Yasna's, but slow, deliberate, almost willful. Instead of Yasna's grace, Myrna's dance expressed a certain dignity, 
the dignity of a stubborn human being determined to reach her goal. Yara and Julia planted themselves next to the dancers and tried to imitate them. Julia did an excellent rendition of Myrna's deliberate, calculated, almost mechanical motions. Only her facial expression was wrong. Julia smiled. Myrna's face was somber, distant. Yara couldn't stop laughing while she imitated Zednik's motionless dance. Her friend Slobodan changed the record and remained standing by the player. He looked terribly bored. My reveries ended when I saw Yasna's hands reaching for mine. She looked sad, old, and skinny again. Your daughter promised, she said. I know, I said apologetically, but you've already seen the only dance I can do. A generous, beautiful smile flashed across Yasna's face. I suddenly wanted to pick her up as I had picked up Julia. Would you like to be spun? Yasna flushed. That's not exactly what I had in mind. Myrna shouted, Go on, Yasna, don't be such a coward. She and Zednik danced straight out of the house, followed by Julia and Yara. Yasna pulled me to the center of the floor. I'll give you that lesson you wanted. You just dance, I insisted, and I'll stand still like Zednik. You have to have known how to dance very well to stand still the way Zednik does. Put your right arm out, jump on your left foot, kick with your right. Don't be so stiff, Yaristan. I was quickly exhausted. Zednik was covered by sweat when he returned. Slobodan was about to start another record, but Myrna stopped him. Let's rest for a while. Isn't anyone hungry? We'll have all that food and beer. Yara helped Myrna cover the dance floor with food. We sat on the floor eating, drinking, smiling, silently. We were intensely happy. Unfortunately, Slobodan was bored. He left our circle and took a walk inside the house. He found his way to Myrna's in my room and turned on the radio. A piercing, alien sound broke through the silence. Under the pretext that our population is out of control, military maneuvers have been observed in... I leapt to my feet and ran to turn the apparatus off, but it was too late. The harm had already been done. The tanks! Myrna shrieked. She started collecting dishes and empty bottles, but on the way to the kitchen she dropped them and ran into her room sobbing. Just like twelve years ago. Slobodan walked toward Yara with a frightened expression on his face. He didn't understand what he had done. Yara put her hand on his shoulder and told him consolingly, Don't lose sleep over it. Something was bound to set that off. She'll be happy again tomorrow. Then she ran to Myrna's room. Julia pulled Slobodan out of the house, saying to me, Thank you for dancing with me, Mr. Vojek. Yasna helped me clear the rest of the floor and then went to thank Myrna and Yarna for the party. On her way out, she shook my hand. The familiar sadness was back on her face. Zednik walked to the bedroom doorway and said, The tanks were there already yesterday, Myrna. They're always there, and they're always on some maneuvers. But they couldn't have taken happiness away from miserable people, Myrna sobbed. They're not yet taking anything away, Myrna, he said hesitantly. It isn't certain. Zednik wasn't certain either. He staggered slightly as he left the house. He seemed to feel depressed, the way he must feel after spending an evening at the bar. Last Saturday, after helping Yara return Julia's phonograph and records, I helped Myrna turn the ballroom back to a living room. Yara spent most of the day packing. The following morning, she left the house with a pack on her back for an outing to the mountains. Yara and several of her friends, including Julia and Slobodan, had looked forward to this outing for several months. They had planned it during a demonstration celebrating the return of a teacher who had been arrested and fired. They had originally intended to invite that teacher, but no other adult to accompany them on the outing. Before the school term ended, they talked themselves into taking the trip unaccompanied by teachers, parents, or anyone older than 12. On Monday morning, Myrna and I returned to our jobs. The air at the carton plant is foul. Everyone in the plant seems to have heard the same radio broadcast. I work silently, keeping to myself, and refuse to participate in speculations about troop and tank movements. I leave the plant early in the afternoon with a splitting headache. When I get home, I find your letter in our box. I finish reading it a few minutes before Myrna returns from work. I hand her your letter, but she brushes it aside, saying she's, quote, too tired to read about other people's problems. I set out the food I'd cooked while reading your letter, but Myrna doesn't eat. She only stirs the food angrily. At last, she stops stirring and slams her fork down on the table. You voted against striking, I venture. That's right, Yorostan. I voted against striking. All last week, I was for it. Everyone was. It would have been unanimous. But the vote was this morning, and this morning we didn't embrace in the aisles or throw spools. I was the first to vote against it. When someone asked if anyone was opposed, I was the first to raise my hand. And just as I expected, another hand went up after mine, and then another. In a minute, at least half the hands were raised. If we'd waited another minute, all the hands would have been up. It would have been unanimous. We talked about striking once, 12 years ago. We embraced, we cried with joy, we loved each other and the world 12 years ago, but only for an instant. It was our joy itself that brought the destruction of, of all we loved. There isn't a person in the workshop who can forget that. 
Myrna is wrong in placing the blame on the victims of the repression, but I don't have the nerve to confront or console her with Zednik's arguments. I go to bed shortly after she does, but I can't easily fall asleep. I'm too depressed. This is the mood we're in when your letter arrives. The following afternoon, the day before I start this letter, I leave the carton plant early again and walk to Yasna's house. She had wanted so badly to be told when another letter from you arrived, and she's overjoyed. Yasna, apparently, has not spent the previous two days speculating about take movements. She runs out of her house, kisses me on the cheek, and exclaims excitedly, I can't wait to read it. I felt so wonderful since your party. I can't tell you. Then at least don't tell Myrna. She's convinced that happiness is inevitably the prelude to... Oh, Yarostan, don't be so mean to her. Yasna puts her arm through mine, and we walk towards the store on our way to my house. Myrna is frightened. Don't you think I am? Yasna reads your letter while I prepare a meal with the groceries she and I bought. I avoid telling her about Myrna's strike vote, so as not to destroy the pretty smile that so transforms her usually sad face. Yasna is still reading when Myrna returns from work. Without greeting either Yasna or me, Myrna walks straight to the bedroom. Yasna gives me a bewildered look but I tend to my cooking. I suppose she thinks Myrna and I had an argument. When I finish the meal, Yasna smiles to me but seems far away. She be seems to be in the house behind the garage with you and Sabina, with Tissy and Jose. I wake Myrna and she drags herself to the table with a sullen, sullen expression. I suppose you know all about it, she grumbles to Yasna. Yasna giggles and waves your letter in the air. That's why I came. I think it's marvelous. Myrna means her strike, I tell her, regretting now that I hadn't mentioned it earlier. There's going to be no strike, Myrna grumbles. The smile leaves Yasna's face. I'm awfully sorry. I, I didn't know. Didn't you? Myrna asks bitterly. Zednik is wrong. All wrong. Of course we lock ourselves up to stop them from doing it. It's so much less painful when we do it ourselves, and we inflict so much less harm on those we love. This is not the same Myrna who, after reading your previous letter, had enthusiastically praised you for being a born troublemaker, just like Jan and Yara. Before starting to eat, she reaches for your letter and grumbles. Let me see something marvelous. It's worse when we do it to ourselves, Myrna. I don't agree with you, Yasna says hesitantly. Yes, you do, Myrna snaps. You've done it all your life. She, she reads the beginning of your letter while eating, turning the pages impatiently, angrily. Suddenly she stops reading, pushes your letter away, and stares at nothing into space. Her eyes have a glassy look, not sad, but removed. Yasna's eyes already have tears in them. Don't judge them, Myrna, please. They never stopped, never retreated, never gave up. I know them, both of them, but I never knew what fires burned in them. I knew Sabina was a devil, all of us knew. But all the other devils I've known were tamed before they left elementary school. She was hardly older than Yara then. And who could have imagined what passion was concentrated inside Sophia, that prim, polite, exaggeratedly correct young lady? I don't have a vantage point from which to judge them, Myrna. I can only gasp with admiration for such unquenchable desire, such burning passion. It's something I've never... Some of us suffer the consequences of that passion. Some of us have paid the devil's price, Myrna grumbles. Yasna, apparently unable to control the flowing tears, objects. I suffered only the consequences, Myrna, never the passion. I lived my whole life with my mind on the consequences, and I ended up paying with my life and getting nothing in return. You're terribly wrong, Myrna. There's nothing more painful than to look back on a life which had no satisfied desires, a life that hadn't ever been lived. How I admire Sophia and Sabina, how I envy them. If I had been only a little bit like them, if I had only had a little courage to reach out for what I desired, and the courage to run away from the consequences, Yasna. Let them be, Myrna, those consequences. Let the devil take them. The devil never takes the consequences. Myrna, please, you don't know them. You haven't finished Sophia's letter. You don't know what Kurt cur Myrna rudely cuts Yasna short. Don't keep repeating that I don't know them. And don't you talk to me about courage and passion. You who've never let yourself be driven by passion. Who've never in your life had the courage to reach out and satisfy a desire. How sorry I felt for the you. How sorry I felt for you the night you told us you'd let every desired being slip by you untouched. Yet you talk about courage and passion. How pitiful. How many lovers have you embraced only in your novels, Yasna? Titus, Yarostan, that Adrian, and how many others? Myrna, that's terribly, terribly cruel. Yasna cries like a child. I beg Myrna not to go on, but she seems not to hear me. Her eyes are glassy. Her expression is cold and distant. She seems to be talking as much to herself as to Yasna. Meek Yasna, spineless Yasna, advise me to let the devil take the consequences. Isn't that cruel? Terribly cruel? Where was Yasna when the devil refused to take them? 
I took the devil into my blood. The devil's passion flowed in my veins. I reached out, touched, grasped, and embraced those the devil drove me to desire. But the devil didn't take the consequences. My brother, my father, and my mother took the consequences. Vesna took the consequences. Yarostan and I suffered the consequences. The devil ran. Wiping her face and trying to control herself, Yasna says, I know the horrors you've lived through for the past twelve years, Myrna. I know you've had four more than your share. I know they've destroyed your past. Why do you let them destroy your present and your future? You're at least fifteen years younger than I am. That's a whole generation, Myrna. Time enough for a whole life. Why do you make yourself do willingly what I couldn't help do doing? Why are you strangling yourself from both directions? Brush me away. Rub me out with the sole of your shoe. I never asked you to take me for a model. But why turn against them in the same breath? If you had known them, if only for an instant. Although it is trivial to the point Yasna is making, I clarify a factual detail to which Yasna refers constantly, but mistakenly. Myrna did in fact know Sabina for an instant. You probably remember that Sabina was Yan's companion during those few days before our arrest. One day Jan introduced Sabina to his parents and to Myrna. What do you mean by introduced, Yarostan? Myrna asks. Jan brought you to the house together with Sabina. I didn't intend to give a full description because I don't see what it has to do with... You didn't see then. You don't see now, and you never will see, Myrna snaps. Yasna pursues her argument a step further. However briefly you knew her, Myrna, didn't she communicate something to you? Something I could never act on? Something having to do with the passion to live? Unhindered? Uninhibited? Unbounded? The glassy expression returns to Myrna's eyes as she drones. Yes, she did, Yasna. That devil communicated her passions to me, just as she communicated to Jan, to Yarostan, to you. And where was she when the three of you were in jail? Myrna, I plead. That's really out of place in this discussion. Where was she when you were taken from me? Where was she when Jan disappeared, when my father died? That's so unfair, Yasna exclaims. Myrna turns her glassy eyes towards Yasna and asks, without anger, almost in a monotone, Why have I had to suffer more than my share of the horrors, Yasna? Why didn't you share some of them with me, at least one? Where were you when Vesna was dying? You had been Jan's friend as well as Yarostan's. With tears rushing to my eyes, I walk behind Myrna and place my hand on her shoulders, trying in vain to make her realize how cruel, irrational, and misplaced her attack is. But Myrna won't be stopped. Vesna was a pupil in your school. You knew she was ill. I needed your courage then, Yasna. Where was it? In your novels? That courage might have saved my Vesna. She might still be alive today. The devil might not have taken her from me. Yasna backs away from the table with a look of intense pain, even horror. Let her go on, Yarostan, she sobs. It's all true. I'm a coward, and cowards are the worst of all criminals. It's because of all the cowards that we've lived through so many horrors. I read my novels and I let it happen, all of it, including Vesna's death. Yasna leaves our house crying. I run after her, afraid of what she might do. I'm terribly sorry, Yasna. I couldn't have imagined she was going to throw that in your face, too. Please don't be sorry for me, Yasna says, trying to smile through her tears. She's so perfectly right about me. I've never faced consequences, and I won't face them now any more than I ever have. That also takes a certain kind of courage. That kind is called cowardice, she says, smiling. It doesn't make you a monster. Yasna hugs me and, and rests her wet cheek on mine. If I were only a bit of monster, Yarostan, if only I had the nerve. If I were at least vengeful, but I'm not, and I don't have the nerve. Can't you guess what I'll do now? I'll go home and read another novel. She smiles as she walks away. When I return, Myrna sits at the kitchen table, staring. I feel mad at her. I consider her attack on Yasna irrational, unprovoked, and heartless. I don't understand, Myrna. You're blaming that poor, harmless woman for everything this police state did to us, to our lives, to those we loved. You're making Yasna a scapegoat. Why? Myrna stares at me, but doesn't say anything, so I continue. Because that's the way you see it. Is that why? Have you ever thought you might be seeing it wrong? I admit you're not inconsistent. You see yourself the same way. According to you, a letter sent to me by Sophia twelve years ago caused my arrest, Jan's disappearance, your father's death, your mother's illness. Is it really impossible for you to imagine that there are places where people receive letters from all parts of the world without being molested by the police? Can't you understand that the cause of the arrests, the deaths, the suffering is one and the same? It's that abomination we put up with for the past 20 years. Vesna didn't die because of you or Yasna or Yara. She suffocated in the rot. She was too sensitive to ignore it and too fragile to withstand it. Do you want to drive Yasna to suicide by throwing Vesna's death in her face? Suicide, Myrna asked coldly, cruelly. Yasna? Suicide takes courage. Myrna, I've never seen you like this. Have you ever seen me, Yarostan? 
You've seen a shepherdess whose only passion was to buy a pair of curtains and a baby carriage. A pretty peasant girl whose desires were limited to displaying herself in the city park wearing city clothes. Then she adds, with a trace of contempt, I've never been near a sheep in my whole life. While saying this, she picks up your letter and goes to the bedroom. Myrna had told me more or less the same thing over two weeks ago, but in a much friendlier way. After reading my previous letter to you, she had said, It is a very pretty portrait, this Myrna of yours, but it's not someone I'd recognize if I met her on the street. I had responded by saying, I, apo I apologize for the distortions. You've never been very eager to tell me about the real Myrna. Obviously not, she exclaimed, throwing her arms around me. You might not like her as well as you like your shepherdess. Myrna is still awake when I enter the bedroom. She has apparently finished your letter. All right, I've never seen you, I admit, sitting down on the edge of the bed. I simply assumed you herded sheep in that village you came from. That's not the same as holding Yasna responsible for Vesna's death. Myrna's response is, I did throw corn to the chickens in our yard, so you weren't so far off. Calling someone a shepherdess isn't the same as calling someone a murderer. I didn't call her a murderer, but a coward, she says, yawning. Suddenly she forces me to forget my anger and drop the whole topic. She sits up and asks, with evident concern, Yaristan, how is it possible that Sophia loved you for all these years if you loved her mother? I told Myrna something about you several months ago, a few days before I wrote you my first letter. Yara had taken part in the first demonstration at her school, Mr. Nonovo had reported me to the police, and the police had come to our house to warn us about Mr. Nonovo. For several days, Myrna was filled with affection. I should learn to use the right word, passion. It was one of the rare times in Myrna's experience when trouble had not been followed by fierce and un unbearably painful repression. Although we, we had barely touched each other since my release from prison two years earlier, we now made love passionately every night. On one of those nights, she asked me, who is Sophia Nachalo? I was obviously stunned. I knew she hadn't ever known you, and I couldn't imagine where she'd heard of you. How in the world do you know about her? I don't know about her, she said. Sophia Nachalo was the name of the sender of the letter that came for you at the time of the Magarna agitation. I remembered Myrna's having told me about a letter when she'd visited me in prison. But I didn't know the letter had come from Sophia, I told her. Then Sophia Nachalo is a real person, she asked? Of course. What makes you think she isn't? Myrna said, I could barely understand the messenger who brought the letter, but I did understand that he delivered a similar letter for Jan to my parents' house, and that the letter had come from someone who'd known you and Jan. So I was sure the letter came from someone else, someone who knew where my parents lived because she'd been there, someone whose name wasn't Sophia, but Sabina. I told Myrna, that's Sophia's younger sister. She exclaimed, then I wasn't so far off. But what makes you think of that letter now, eleven and a half years later? Myrna answered, because I'm happy now, as happy as I was then, and because I know I'll have to pay for that happiness, just as I did then. I knew that that letter from Sabina was the devil's bill of charges, and I still know that's what it was, even if your Sophia sent it. I asked, the devil's what? You sound just like your crazy mother when you say things like that. Myrna said, I don't care what I sound like. My mother wasn't as crazy as people thought. Two hours after that letter arrived, the police came looking for it. That same instant, other police were at my father's house, beating him because he refused to give them a letter for Jan. That night, Jan disappeared, and you didn't come home. I responded angrily, But that's ridiculous. You're making this so-called devil responsible for events that have no connection with each other. You know perfectly well that Jan and I were arrested because of what we were doing in the steel plant, and your father couldn't have been beaten because he received a letter that no one ever read from a Sophia Nachalo he'd never met. Your father was probably beaten because he was Jan Sedlak's father. Can't you see that those events were pure coincidences? Myrna was silent for a while. Then she said, caressing me gently, All right, lover. I'll pretend to see they were pure coincidences if you tell me how much you loved your Sophia. That was when I told Myrna. She wasn't my Sophia, and I never loved her. I'm not going to pretend you're right if you don't tell me, she said. But it's true, I insisted. You've never really known me, Yarastan, she told me. You've never known that jealousy isn't something that flows in my blood. If you brought your Sophia to bed, I'd only love you all the more. I said, I don't believe you, but I'm not hiding anything from you. Anyway, it all happened when you were still in elementary school, so why would you be jealous? I slept with Sophia three or four times, just before our arrest, but I didn't love her. If you want to know the truth, I was madly in love with Sophia's mother. I dreamed of Sophia's mother during my whole first prison term, and I was still in love with her when I met you, when we were married, and when I was arrested the second time. Myrna pressed me to her and exclaimed excitedly, Her mother? That's wonderful. I'll pretend anything you want if you tell me about her. Was she anything like Sabina? Why don't you write her? 
She was a devil in her own way, I told her, but I don't love her anymore. And how could I write her? Do you want me to go to the police and ask for Sophia's address? I don't even know that Sophia and her mother are still together. Then Myrna admitted slyly, I memorized the address on that envelope. Somewhat stupefied, I'd ask, and you remembered it until now? Why? She said, because I thought the letter came from Sabina. I fell asleep without telling her about Louisa, and she didn't ask again, until two nights ago, after her argument with Yasna. Myrna's question makes me swallow my anger toward her. It makes me forget my pity for Yasna. Her question brings back the embarrassment, I should say guilt, I'd felt the day before, while reading your letter. I suppose Sophia never knew how much I loved Louisa, and I suppose she still doesn't know. Sophia thought you loved her, didn't she? I suppose she did. I know what you're getting at, Myrna, and I know you're right. I was a coward, and I'm still a coward. I treated Sophia very badly. Yes, terribly. And I didn't have the nerve to tell her. I still don't have the nerve. I can't see why, Myrna exclaims, grasping your letter. Who would have the nerve to tell such a correct young lady? I slept with your mother. A young lady so sensitive to the correct age and the correct sex of the correct couple. The thought that Tina slept with Ted, and she didn't convince me of that, drove her out of her mind. After she caught her mother with her boyfriend, she dramatically left them both and buried herself in a factory, although she obviously didn't have to. She does have something in common with our Yara, but she also has something in common with our Vesna. So you lied to her to avoid hurting her. That's very thoughtful, Yara Stan. It shows you did love her. If I had only lied to Vesna and kept lying to her, she'd still be alive today. I don't understand, Myrna. Why do you bring up Vesna? She cuts me short. Tell me about Louisa. Tell me everything Sophia doesn't know, and I'll pretend to forget Vesna, at least for the time being. Twenty years of lying is twenty years too many. I tell Myrna, quote, everything, and I'm going to tell all of it to you. I don't know how Myrna could have helped Vesna by lying to her, but I do know that I've, quote, helped you in just, the way, in just that way long enough, far too long. I understand that you genuinely loved Jose, and I'm relieved by your telling me that you never felt that kind of love for me. I don't fully understand why you left Jose, and I'm embarrassed by your insistence that this had something to do with me, or rather with, quote, Yaristan. I add this because your Yaristan has nothing in common with me. Your Yaristan is a product of your imagination, a composite of all the people you loved or wished you had loved. The real Yaristan turned to you only when he felt rejected and betrayed. He turned to you dishonestly. He abused you and lied to you. He used you as a substitute, as a last resort. I know it's extremely crude of me to tell you this after reading your moving account of your painful experiences in Sabina's garage. I'm expressing myself as crudely as possible. What would have happened, according to your imagination, if you had come here 12 years ago, or the day before yesterday? Did you really think I would have said goodbye to Myrna and Yara the moment I saw you? How much pain would you have felt if I had told you only then that you had made a big mistake, that I had respected you once, perhaps even admired you, but that I couldn't find a trace of my love for you in my memory? Would you have been grateful to me then for lying to you so thoughtfully for so long? And is it really altogether my fault that you can still speak of, quote, flying to me? Have the clues I left in all my letters been altogether undecipherable to you? But I'm judging you, and I've no right to. I carried an illusory Louisa in my heart for many years, after reality itself had made the real Louisa plainly visible to me. And, in spite of my determination to be as crudely clear as possible, I wouldn't be completely open with you unless I admitted that your declaration of your twenty-year-long love for me doesn't leave me cold. Yes, the knowledge that one is desired stimulates desire. But please understand this, Sophia. My love for you would have been born in the present. It couldn't be built on any love I felt for you in the past. Quote, when did you first meet Sophia's mother? Myrna asks. What was she like? Did you think of her as your mother, or she of you as her son? Did you run after her, or did she catch you? Why did you accompany Jan and Sabina to my house? Were you running from Louisa, chasing Sabina, looking for fresh air? If I hadn't accompanied them, you and I would never have met. Don't I know, Myrna exclaims. Jan would have spent the night with Sabina. I would have married that peasant I was engaged to. My whole family would be alive and well today. But I promise to pretend for to forget. Well, tell me, unless you're sleepy. No, I'm not sleepy at all. I'm wide awake and very excited. Myrna is 29. Louisa was 28 when I first met her. I was 15. The war was over and quickly forgotten. Only fairy tales survived. The resistance was over. Half the resistors were dead, and they were quickly forgotten. Only fairy tales survived about that as well. It was a time for fairy tales about the past and the future. I suppose that's why Titus first took me to Louisa's house. He thought I ought to have a little, quote, political consciousness. Why not, after all? I was already a proven fighter. I could shoot. I could work. All I couldn't do was, quote, think politically. 
and what better teacher could have been found? I had already seen her in the carton plant. As soon as I stepped into your house, which to me was and remains Louisa's house, I was instantly, quote, politicized. I was converted. Even better, seduced. I was seduced by every story she told, by every theory she expressed, by the tone of her voice, by her lips, by her eyes, by her body, her hair. I believe you were in that house, too. But I don't remember your presence there because I wasn't aware of it. All that existed for me was Louisa. I wallowed in Louisa, swam in Louisa. I became Louisa. I memorized everything she said and even copied her manners. I tried to think of what I took to be her thoughts. Did I think of her as my mother, my imaginary mother? I don't know. I did think of her as the most daring, courageous, intelligent, imaginative, and beautiful human being in the world, and in a sense I was her, quote, son, certainly intellectually. But I didn't think of her in personal terms at all, in terms of her physical relationship to me. I thought of her in terms of the barricades, in terms of the workers' own genuine union, in terms of the struggle we were preparing ourselves for. I thought of her in terms of the revolution. Louisa and revolution were synonyms to me. You learned Sabina's outlook in her friend's bar. You seem to have learned it then for the first time and to have been somewhat shocked by it. Yet Sabina couldn't have chosen better words to describe what I experienced in Louisa's house. All relationships were open. Nothing was left unsaid. There were no secrets, no taboos. Nothing was forbidden. Did I desire Louisa already then? Yes, I did, desperately, with all my being. But I didn't, quote, run after her. She already had two lovers, or, quote, husbands, George Alberts and Titus Zabron. And I didn't consider myself a likely candidate for a third, not so much because of my age as my, quote, political backwardness. Besides, Titus had been a friend to me since the war, almost a brother. He'd introduced me to Louisa, and I didn't want to stab him in the back for all his kindness. Almost two years I loved Louisa in the shape of the revolution. I did everything to prepare myself for her. I read, concentrated, talked. I ran after the revolution. It was Louisa who, quote, caught me. Show me how she caught you. How old was she then? She was a year older than you are now. But I couldn't show you in the dark, Myrna, because she did it in broad daylight, as she did everything else. She was 30. I was 17. I suppose relationships weren't as open as I thought. Not everything was said, and there were secrets, since you, since you never knew about us. But I couldn't have known at the time that you, who lived in Louisa's house, didn't know about our love. I couldn't have known that, in your eyes, two people separated by more than a decade didn't constitute a, quote, correct couple. But I admit I wouldn't have acted differently if I'd known. It happened in the carton plant, during work hours. Louisa was carrying on a heated argument with Claude Tamnich. I obviously don't remember the subject of the argument, but I do remember both of them quite clearly, and I can easily imagine what they were talking about. Claude was probably insisting that solidarity and comradeship meant spying, liquidating, jailing, torching, killing. Whether he actually said that or something similar, he infuriated Louisa. Stunted baboon, she called him, and fascist, both of which titles he undoubtedly deserved. Louisa stomped around the shop muttering, I'll show you what workers mean by union, by comradeship, by solidarity. She came to me first and locked her arm in mine. Then she locked her other arm in Adrian's. Quickly, Jan, Vera, Titus joined us, and Yasna last. We moved toward Claude like a stone wall. Join us or get out, Louisa shouted. Claude was undecided at first. Then he turned and walked out of the room. We roared with laughter as we returned to our machines. Small wonder the same Claude later spread the rumor that Louisa was a foreign spy. Louisa returned with me, her arm still locked in mine. Suddenly she turned and pressed her chest, her whole body, against my arm. She whispered, That's what comradeship means. I almost fainted. I knew Titus had seen us. I supposed everyone had. But I didn't move. I won't say I couldn't move. I didn't want to. I had, at last, graduated. I had become a politically conscious militant. My revolution, everything I had wanted from life during every minute of the previous two years, had come. I became a revolutionary cadre the following afternoon, during a break, in the stockroom of the carton plant. Your mother, Sophia, a woman almost old enough to be mine, in one of your letters, you moralized for several pages about the fact that I was married. It's my turn to moralize. I actually doubt that you'd know about my passion for Louisa if you'd seen us embracing. You wouldn't have seen the embrace because you wouldn't have believed either of us capable of it. When you saw Louisa lying with Alec that night you left them, why did you assume it was Alec who had seduced Louisa, and only in order to spite you? Why did you become so infuriated when Tina left you to join a man twice her age? I can't speak of your experience, but I can tell you from mine that your correct relationships are not the only ones possible. 
For a whole year, Louisa and I made love daily, in the stock room, in your house. I suppose you weren't even there at the time. In my modest room. My love for her was total. My desire for her unquenchable. Neither my love nor my desire could have been more complete, more perfect, if Louisa had been fifteen years younger. Quote, where did Sophia get the idea you loved her? Are you leaving something out? No, this time I'm not leaving anything out. I hadn't paid any attention to you or Sabina before the strike up broke out. Louisa brought both of you to the plant on the first day of the strike. I still didn't notice you. All I noticed was Louisa's sudden and inexplicable coldness toward me. She suddenly treated me not as a complete stranger, but as a fellow worker with whom she'd not had intimate relations. I tried to explain this to myself in terms of her desire to be free and unattached on the eve of the great event. I tried to explain it in terms of my, quote, political backwardness. On the very first day of the strike, Louisa already had a position. Titus had another, Jan a third, Vera a fourth, while I was completely at sea. All I could think of was Louisa's sudden indifference to me. Everything seemed to become clear on the second day when, after a group meeting, Titus told me furiously that I would have done better to remain in the city's basements and alleys. I thought he was finally responding to my having stabbed him in the back by taking Louisa from him. I concluded they'd had a scene, that Titus had shamed Louisa into abandoning her affair with the irresponsible adventuristic hooligan. I was ashamed, not only of my stab in the back, but also of my persisting political illiteracy. I had to prove myself, both to Titus and to Louisa. I had to show them their attempts to educate me hadn't been wasted. At our next meeting, I suppose that was the third day, I brought up the fact that the, quote, class oppressor, Mr. Zagad, was still sitting in his office counting his future profits while we merely talked about slogans on posters. I was only stating what everyone knew, yet everyone, even Claude, responded as if I'd discovered a new planet. I grinned with pride. I thought that in Louisa's and Titus's eyes, I had become a strategist. You bothered to remember my strategy for twenty years. In one of your letters, you told me you admired me, you fell in love with me when I proposed my, quote, plan. Yet all your admiration, as well as all my pride, were badly misplaced. That strategy wasn't really mine, nor was I the one who implemented it. I merely stated the obvious. Zagad was still in his office. It wasn't I, but Claude, who suggested doing something about this. I merely watered down Claude's suggestions by asking if instead of locking Zagad into his office, we couldn't just ask him to leave. And for this, I was giving credit for our one concrete accomplishment, our sole real feat. Yes, the only genuine event that we set off during those two weeks. Everything we did after Zagad was ousted, all those activities you remember so vividly, were nothing. We were merely treading water to keep from drowning. I was proud of myself as the, quote, instigator of that event. But I wasn't the one who instigated it, nor the one who implemented it. Much as we all disliked Claude, it was he who insisted and also implemented our single concrete deed. It was an action perfectly suited to his temperament. It had to do with liquidating, 